Good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to be here with you, and I thank you for the time that you're giving today. We're so thrilled to have MIT Tech Review and their event here as well. I was thinking about the kickoff here today, and I was just thinking about the future and how our views on the future are shaped by media and by uh, popular entertainment. I was thinking of some of the, the more famous uh, moments in AI history. Of course, HAL in 2001, A Space Odyssey. You know, this was a computer that could do everything we think about in narrow AI today. It, could, uh, it had uh, speech recognition, could actually sense emotions. So, so badly did that go that when it thought that people were gonna pull the cord, it decided it would kill all the astronauts. So that was a scary beginning to the AI, uh, AI futures that we had ahead. Of course, Terminator, the new version of Terminator comes out this weekend uh, in Singapore, another dystopian future uh, for us all to get excited about. But a lot, of, uh, a lot of our impressions about technology and some of the fears that people have about technology are set by the way stories are framed in our media. Um, just last weekend in the, in the UK Sunday Times, there was an interview with Stuart Russell. Stuart Russell comes from Berkeley, of course, and wrote probably the book on, uh, on how AI is seen and the possibilities of AI. And actually, he writes uh, very positively. He, has a, he says that we should have a vision for AI that is positive, and then we should realize that. And of course, the headline that this Sunday, oh, I should also say, by the way, he refuses to be in any article where Terminator is actually mentioned. So the headline they managed to come up with in this very positive visionary interview was, AI guru says, alarm on jobs. And of course, what did they publish next to his photo? A photo of the Terminator. Uh, so that's, you know, that's how we get influence here. So no wonder that there's some fear about you know, what this might all do. But of course, in Asia Pacific, there's a lot to be positive about. Over the last 50 years, hundreds of millions of people have been uh, lifted out of poverty uh, by themselves, by the governments, by efforts to grow the economies. By 2020, more than half of the world's middle class will be based in this region. And of course, some of the smartest and most educated are in this region. Seven of the 10 leading world uh, cities and countries for education around STEM are here in the region, with Singapore being number one and Japan being number two, but seven of the 10. So in many ways, it's a story of progress here. You know, technology, science, engineering, mathematics, these have been things that we've, we've lifted ourselves up with. Uh, in a lot of ways, our cities are the fastest growing in the world, the people are positive, and they're tech forward. They're not afraid of the tech, not the way it's sold in, uh, in TV and media. But there are still issues that need to be dealt with in the region. Uh, food and safety, is our, is, is, is our food safe to eat? Uh, 275 million people fall ill from foodborne disease every year in this region. Uh, 275,000 people will die because of foodborne uh, disease. There's more we can do there. Pollution, 99 of the 100 world's most polluted cities are in this region. Again, a place where we can do a lot and we can make a big difference. Um, access to basic services, still you know, lots to do there as well. Um, only 27% of people in the Southeast Asia region actually have a bank account. There's a huge number still unbanked, 77% in the Philippines as an example. And while India has made a lot of progress, uh, now there's only about 20% uh, unbanked, still 60% of women are unbanked. So, you know, lots to do uh, in that area. And then finally, education. So 30% of children, or 11.3 uh, million children in the region, don't have education past very basic uh, early uh, education. So lots that we can do there. Um, the future, of course, is bright, and it will be more than tech that will take us there. At the core of everything, it's about people. And today, we will talk about tech, but it's going to be relevant in the context of people. And that's the way we'll talk about it. It'll be the combination of tech plus people fueled by data. And we'll spend a lot of time on that uh, today. The, in fact, IBM's Institute of Business Value, where we do a lot of research on, on the future, have said that it's not just tech. The most important aspect of the enterprise of the future will still be about the people, that humanity will be at the heart of the cognitive enterprise, the enterprise of the future. Okay, so let's go back to those four challenges that I mentioned and talk about some inspiring projects 
that are going on throughout the region. The first one, how do we guarantee that food is safe? How do we ensure that our people are safe? Well, enter IBM's Food Trust. So this is a uh, coming together of an ecosystem uh, made up of the four top retailers uh, in the US, plus Carrefour, plus Unilever, Mars, Nestle, Tyson, who are all getting together to improve traceability and transparency in the supply chain. They've been able to take from days the ability to trace where a piece of food came from, maybe shrimp that came in from somewhere, maybe pork from China, the 30 different people who touch it along the way, they've been able to trace that in seconds, moving from weeks, days, down to seconds, to really help us keep our people uh, safer. Pollution, a great example of how a social enterprise can help the unbanked uh, with pollution. So in the Philippines, where I said 77% of people do not have a bank account, the plastic bank have also looked at the fact that there's an enormous amount of pollution. In fact, humans create 350 billion kilograms of trash that ends up in the ocean, on our grounds. In fact, uh, 10 billion kilograms uh, end up in the ocean every single year. There's already 150 billion uh, kilograms of uh, trash, uh, in, 150 billion kilograms of trash in our oceans today. So what Plastic Bank have done is they take that plastic back and on a blockchain they give credit uh, to the people who bring in the plastic and they're able to use those credits to buy fuel, to buy things that they need so that we start a virtuous circle and we can bring them uh, to prosperity. We give them a new sense of worth. Now that is an example of the power of tech plus people to bring good. Into banking, some great examples here. The State Bank of India, 200 million customers that they have have launched a new app called Yono. You only need one is, is the app. And essentially, they're, they're realizing that everyone in India has a mobile phone. So they're extending services that otherwise they didn't have access to, where they were, were being held ransom by loan sharks, for example, and paying 20 plus percent on interest on loans. They're able to now access the State Bank of India's very low uh, interest rates and access thousands of partners across 19 different ca uh, categories and get access to things otherwise they had no access to at all. Another great example of tech in action. Around education, uh, around the region, we now have something called Pathways to Technology. Now this is a coming together of government, of IBM, and of industry to provide STEM education to those who otherwise would not have it. It's a six-year program. It begins at the beginning of high school and goes all the way through to apprenticeships at the end of it. We now have in 25 cities around Asia Pacific these pathways to technology curriculums uh, that are opening new opportunities to our people. So we believe that it's all about progress. Technology can help us create a new future uh, for the people in the region. It can make a difference uh, in lives. We're seeing scaling around AI as we move to, from experiment uh, to real implementation and real impact and real outcomes. We're seeing the embracing of cloud technology to make all of this more accessible and accessible on wide scale. And we're seeing a prioritization on trust and transparency. I want to leave you with, uh, with a quote from IBM's founder and uh, actually his son. Uh, a great quote that uh, I think really laid out uh, a lot of the thinking behind today's event, and that is that our machines should be nothing more than tools that will extend the power of the human beings that use them. It's been an honor to be here today with you, and I can't wait to see the rest of the curriculum. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to uh, thank you, and I'd like to now invite our next speaker up, uh, Alex Carson is a senior partner for McKinsey based out of Hong Kong, and uh, please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for uh, having me here today. Such a distinguished crowd. I'm really, really pleased to be here. So I'm uh, Axel. Um, I've spent the last 20 years of my life with McKinsey. Uh, I used to lead the Swedish office. I led the tech practice in Europe. And now since four years back, I'm based in Hong Kong, leading the Asia Tech Media Telecoms practice. If I reflect back on my 20 years with McKinsey and serving tech companies, uh, one of my biggest reflections is, wow, the last decade, everything happened much quicker than I ever thought. 
I underplayed the technology development when I was advising my clients. And probably, if I ask myself one year out how much will happen, I probably overstated the development. But looking a decade out, I probably understated the development, because somehow we easily miss the compound effect of technology development. Now, looking ahead, and this is what my little speech will be about today, I believe tech development will never go slower than it does today. This is kind of the theme of my speech. It will never go slower than it does today, despite how amazed we've been about how fast it's gone. This is how fast it will go. And there is some form of pace of life in our society that is just increasing exponentially. So if you look back to Big Bang, Big Bang was 14 billion years ago. Then you can kind of divide that by four, and then we saw the first life on Earth. Uh, maybe you divide by four again, and then we saw some first animal-like species on Earth. And you can continue dividing by four and dividing by four, and soon you came to the Industrial Revolution, and you came to the computer, and the pace is just continuing to accelerate in a truly, truly exponential way. Now, if you take this trend and you then apply it to technology, we see precisely the same thing on technology. But, of course, the time scale is much shorter. But it actually took 60 years for the telephone to get to 50% adoption rate. It took 15 years for the Internet to get to the same adoption rate. And now when we see new technical phenomena, they get deployed much quicker than we ever saw before. It's an exponential development. And if we look ahead, I believe this development will just continue. So look at the big um, universities, the most prestigious universities. When I joined McKinsey, the most popular topic was economics. And now it's computer science. The universities that didn't give courses in computer science are now giving computer science majors. Look at what's happening in Asia. Asia is spitting out more engineers per year than we've ever spat out in Sweden, where I come from. And instead of being hardware-centric, we're more software-centric, and the software development cycle is, by its nature, much quicker than the hardware cycle. So probably, if we look ahead, this will go even faster. Now, while technology develops so fast, there's something that is pretty stable. And I think that many of my clients often miss this, and this is basic human needs. And basic human needs actually remain very much the same if you apply a certain lens to it. I mean, we do have certain needs relating to our existence, we have certain needs relating to leisure, we have certain needs relating to safety. And you could say these needs change, but I actually believe the needs don't change, it's how we um, um, supply products to cater for these needs that changes. The needs stay very much the same. And if you look at the great tech disruptors, what they often do is they look back to this picture and they try to understand customer needs. And they ask themselves, how can we fulfill these needs in an innovative way? And I also think incumbents, the old traditional companies that some of you represent, this is often where we and incumbents fail to look at customer needs in an innovative way so we can serve these needs differently going forward and avoid being disrupted. So while technology changes so fast, the basic needs stay roughly the same. Now, what about the future? Um, and when I was asked here to summarize what is the future, I thought I'll summarize it in three points. The future is technology. There will be good aspects of technology and bad aspects. The future is ecosystems. There will come out a lot of new services, and we will need ecosystems to effectively deploy them. And the future is Asia. We're in Asia today, and it's hard to not comment on the development of Asia and how important Asia will be going forward for the coming 10 or 20 years. Now, if we start with technology, what I thought I'd do is share a few examples of innovations that are a little bit out there. A little bit, you know, they're not here today, maybe they're here in some prototype, but five or ten years from now, they will really transform the world. And I will use these innovations as examples of what transformation will we probably see. And this is, of course, superficial, but it still hints to the 
technology transformation we will see in the coming five to ten years. But first, I wanted to start with a fun story saying that we already today have technology that is changing lives. And maybe many of you know this little story. It's been widely published in many papers. The gentleman to the left was out running. And the next thing he knew, he ended up in hospital, and he didn't know what happened between he was running and lying in a hospital bed. And he'd actually had a fall and uh, a very irregular heart rate. But he was wearing a smart watch, and the smart watch detected both the fall and the irregular heart rate, and it called 911. And it also called his wife. And the geolocation enabled the watch to direct the emergency service to the right place, and the guy was saved, and now he's happily alive. So I just wanted to share it to say, already today, we have these type of remarkable gadgets that actually save lives. And if we play this forward for healthcare, we will, of course, see a remarkable development over the coming 20, 30 years um, through technological innovation. In my home country, Sweden, already today, 20% of the population have a healthcare app in their phone where they get medical advice over the internet. If you couple to this the developments in AI, there's no doubt that we see a revolution where a lot of the screening may not take place in hospitals. It may take place in the cloud. And the accessibility to healthcare will, of course, also change a lot. In the Western world, where healthcare often is free, this will declog the system when you take more people out of hospitals and you can do diagnosis in a different way. In poorer countries, this will give access to healthcare for people who don't have access today. In radiology, this will improve the accuracy in how we look at imaging. So healthcare is truly changing based on AI and based on internet-based medicine. I also wanted to uh, put on the right-hand side here implantable RFIDs. This is another little bit more far out there thing, but actually a few test cases have started putting implantable RFIDs into their body. And of course, this can be used for detection of health, uh, payments, um, for shopping, for all kinds of purposes that we can only imagine today. And if you couple implantable RFIDs with uh, what you see to the left with AI, you can see that we will see a very different future in healthcare. This will in turn drive a revolution how we see hospitals, how governments will have to act, how the big healthcare providers will have to act. And if you think in those lines, I think we can all imagine, wow, this will be a quite different world 15, 20 years from now. A more well-known phenomenon is, of course, autonomous driving. We all know about it. Maybe you have a Tesla, it can almost drive by itself. But if you have young kids, I'm quite convinced that when they're grown up, they will speak about their dad or mother saying that, oh, actually, my mom, she drove the car herself when I was a kid. Can you believe it? Uh, I'm sure it will be banned. It will be too dangerous to drive your own car, and we will all be driving around or being driven around by autonomous vehicles. Um, now, this will, of course, change the car industry. Probably fewer people will own their own car. This will change parking. Maybe the cars drive around when needed and they just pick you up. So um, the level of transformation driven by autonomous driving will also be very large. Finally, I will just touch upon virtual reality. Virtual reality is also just beginning. And um, uh, this will, of course, totally transform the entertainment industry. But also important to remember, it will also transform how we think about production, how we think about product development, how we think about retail. When you buy clothes, how will you buy clothes? How we think about travel, how we think about education. And if you then look at those industries, how will this drive disruption? How will the current internet giants need to reinvent themselves to be able to cope with this development? How will we consume media? This will also drive a revolution. So technology will drive societal change at a pace we've never seen before. Now, my second point is ecosystems. So, undoubtedly, there will come a lot of new stuff to market, which will need to be deployed in some form of digital service. And how you get the consumer to accept a new digital service and understand how to use it, we and I believe will require ecosystems. 
Uh, already now, we have hundreds and thousands of daily needs, healthcare, education, and we are consuming products, often in an analog or uh, old-fashioned way. If we're now going to change this and move more and more things online to digital world, leveraging new technology, uh, the consumer easily becomes a bit confused. You have to choose between multiple providers, some with a brand that you don't recognize, others with a brand you do recognize, different price points. How do you choose? How do you get where you want to get with your decision as a consumer? And this requires ecosystems. It's much easier for the consumer to make a choice if you have access to a portal that's trusted or some form of system that helps you make your choice. And just to make a comparison, many of you know Spotify, the music service. It's quite fun to know that when it really took off was when they came into the telcos ecosystem, when they partnered with the telcos. So it became known to wider audience how you could use the music service. It was even bundled into what you bought as, as your subscription in some countries, and the music service took off. It was around before that, but too few knew about it. So it really requires an ecosystem to drive early adoption. The Chinese are, of course, really on this ball and very quick to grab the opportunity. And we all know about the bats, but I mean, I guess you've also heard about Ping An. It used to be a traditional insurance company. Now it's a fully digital insurance company, but they've also branched out to healthcare, they branch out to entertainment, and they're really leveraging the ecosystem thinking to drive their own success for the coming 10 to 20 years. So, final point from me today, the future is Asia. Um, when I grew up in Sweden, Asia was a very emerging place, and now when I've lived in Asia for four years, it's remarkable what is happening here. And I believe 20, 30 years from now, the development will just continue, and Asia will, of course, be leading the world. It's just a question of time before China overtakes the US. And I just wanted to share a few facts um, internet users. I mean, if you add up Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Bangladesh, and Indonesia, they have more internet users than the US today. Imagine how this will reshape the world. If you look at the 10 top global tech companies, four of the top 10 are Asian today. None of them were that 2009. No Asians 2009, four today. Imagine what that will look like in 10 or 20 years. Unicorns. 36% of unicorns are in Asia today. And the average time to become a unicorn, it get, goes even faster in Asia than it does in the US or in Europe. And China, the Chinese online retail market, it's larger than the next 10 markets combined. It's just staggering. And you already have many companies that are well-known, that are innovative, unicorns, leading the game. But Asia will not be a follower going forward. Asia will be the leader. So, to sum up my little speech, we're reaching the end. Uh, the change, we will never see a slower world than we're seeing today. It will just go faster. The future is technology, the future is ecosystems, and the future will be here in Asia. Thank you very much.